Soul Out Church family and friends, Pastor Blake here. Excited and thankful to be with you yet another week on this side of the dirt. I'm standing in what is now our downtown Gulfport campus. I'm super, super thrilled. I can't wait to see all of you here. I'm in this building with me, worshiping and singing our faces off and preaching the word and reaching the city of Gulfport and the Mississippi Gulf Coast for the glory of Christ. I can't wait till that day comes and it is very, very close. So stick around uh, for the next couple of days. You're going to see uh, and hear some information that you do not want to miss. But um, today we are going to be in Psalm 121 and I'm excited to talk about some good news that we all need to hear about the Lord and about our lives that uh, we so desperately need in this time. I know I do. I hope it's an encouragement to you. So if you get a chance, go ahead, open up your Bibles, open up your phones. If you use version, um, you can use your Android device or smartphones and you can follow along and get all our sermon notes there. But Psalm 121 is where we're going to be today. Um, I remember being about a little bit less than 10 years old, maybe nine or eight years old, um, my mother had planned this long trip from Detroit to, to Canada to go to one of their theme parks. I believe it was called Wonderland or something like that. But anyway, it was such a big deal. And for an eight, nine-year-old, it seemed like the longest ride in the world. And so I'm building up this anticipation, all of that. Me and my two sisters and my mother, she's a, she was a single mom, and she was working and busting her tail um, to get this thing done and to surprise us with, with this, this amazing, amazing time. And I remember being such a spoiled brat. By the time we got there, of course, I'm always saying, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Expecting it to be amazing. But when we got there, the first words out of my mouth were, is this it? With this level of disgust and uh, a, a disappointment that I'm sure crushed my mom. And I remember the look that she gave with just sheer disappointment and hurt. And being the, the wonderful mom that she is, she pressed on and we ended up having a a good time, but I was un unimpressed. It wasn't what I expected. Well, the truth of the matter is, I think most of us, if not all of us, can connect with what it looks like to, to either be on a long trip or have a, a big project that we've been looking for and planning for for a long time, or even if it's a, a career that we have been working hard for, going through school, all of that, to, we just can't wait to get into, or it could even be a relationship. You know, that, that fine girl that you've been pursuing since grade school. Now you finally done made some out of yourself and you finally get a chance to get her. Or that guy, you've been waiting to ask you out and all of that. And you've been anticipating and building this up. And you're so excited, so thrilled, only to get it, only to receive it or to get there. And you're like, is that it? And it feels like that the journey, the long wait, wasn't worth the destination. The destination wasn't worth the journey. Well, the truth of the matter is, for the people of God, we know all too well what this feels like. Sometimes, I think oftentimes, especially during times like this, many of us have had these thoughts and we've had these feelings. It seems as if the destination, wherever we're going, is not worth the journey. The journey right now is way too hard. It seems like it's not worth it. Like, let me off the ship, get me off the road. Well, I got news for you today. Hopefully you may see the excitement and the passion in my, in my eyes. I have news for you today. That is simply not true. Wherever God has you right now, whether it's a, you're in a bad situation, whether Corona's just rocking your life or uh, the, 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 the economy is doing some things or your family, you're going through some hardship right now or some personal injuries, some physical health or loss of loved ones, whatever it is, wherever God has you right now, if it's a tough season, if it's a marriage, if it's a deployment, your spouse is away or just life, wherever God is taking you, the destination is always worth the journey. I want you to hear me. Wherever God has you right now, whatever that journey looks like for you, it's worth it when you get to where God's taking you to. I want to encourage you to hang in there. I want to encourage you to have some joy in your heart, even though it's hard, because the destination is worth it. It really is, which uh, brings us to what we have in front of us today, which is Psalm 121. This is what is called a song of ascent. 
in Hebrew, that word ascent simply means rising or to rise or to go up in various ways. Songs of Ascent, they're basically, they're 15 songs in the book of Psalms, or one of the book of the Psalms, 15 songs from Psalm 120 to Psalm 134, that according to the best scholarship that's out there, these songs were sung by the people of God in Israel while they made their pilgrimage or their journey to Jerusalem from where they were living outside the neighboring towns and cities They made their trek up the mountain to the city of Jerusalem to go into the middle of the city, which is the temple, and to worship God. And they were to do this by God's command three times a year during the three major feasts of Israel, which are Passover, Pentecost, and the Feast of Booths. So three times a year they would make this trek, and along the way, They would sing these songs. So what they would do is that they would begin with Psalm 120. They would begin with Psalm 120 where they were far away from the city. So they start off very far away from the city in their towns, getting close towards the the mountain where they would have to travel up to the temple, to the city of God. They would start with Psalm 120. And then when they got to the base of the mountain, right before they started their trek up the mountain, they would be singing Psalm 121, which is where we are. As they're looking up the hill, looking up the mountain, this is where they got to the point where they started to sing Psalm 21, 21. By the time they made their trek all the way, so all the way up the mountain, they had to sing Psalm 121. And then when they got to the city itself, they were in Psalm 122. When they arrived into the city, they were in Psalm 122. So the rest of the group of the songs are actually sung when they were in the city. Some of them actually in the temple where the priests and the Levites and the musicians and the singers will be worshiping and singing these songs, all 15 of them. This is where they were. Why is this so important? This is so important, not just because context is always important, and it is to understand the Bible, and we're all about context, teaching and preaching the Bible in its context. This information is so important. This background, this context is so important. Not just because context is important, but because it is so vital for us to understand why this particular psalm of ascent and the others that follow are so important and so relevant for us today. And here it is. We are the people of God today. We are his people. And all of us, every last one of us who belong to Jesus, we're on a journey. We are on a pilgrimage somewhere, and it is important for us to know that that pilgrimage, that journey where God has us and where he's taking us to, is full of hills, twists, turns, and sharp cuts, things seen, things unseen, things we can't prepare for, some slippery rocks and all kinds of stuff, some trees that may fall, some dangerous stuff, some hardship, a blazing sun that's shining in our face, some heat in our life. This life is full of those things. And we need to know who to trust. We need to know who's looking out for us. And we need to know, get this, that the destination is worth the journey. Where we're going, who we meet when we get there is worth the hard trek up the hill. So that brings us to the psalm. Last week, we learned that we can cry out to God even when it's hard. And especially when it's hard, it's okay to pray. It's okay to cry out to him. Even when we come into our life and we see, it seems like none of the lights are on. Like it's dark and it's heavy and it's difficult. And it doesn't seem like it's going to change right away. Remember, Psalm, Psalm 88 didn't end with a celebration like, oh, God fixed it. Now, it's okay to cry out to him and to trust him, even when, it's get, when it gets hard and it gets harder and harder and harder. And we're crying out, crying out, crying out. And it seems like he didn't pick up the phone yet. It's okay to cry out to him. This week, we get to make our journey up the hill. We get to get out of the valley a little bit. Unless we're going to make our journey out of the hill with joy in our heart. We should have a smile on our face and confidence that God has got this. And he's got us. He's got us. Things, y'all, I need you to hear me, will get better. Listen, 2020 has been a year for the books. It's been a year for the ages. This is nothing like any of us have ever seen. So much loss, 
so much difficulty, so much heat, so much pressure, so much of everything that it's like we need it to change. I don't know about you, but that's been my, my cry for a minute. I need it to change, Lord. I need you to do something like quickly. No more. I'm going to work on my Spanish a little bit. No mas. I don't want any. Can you please let up? Let's go up the hill now. We've been in the valley long enough. We've been in a hard place, hostile place, bad place long enough. Can you start turning some things around? I need to encourage somebody today that it will get better. This is not the end. Things will change. They will get better. And listen to me, they have to. And they will. And here's why. Psalm 122. It's going to tell us two things, two major reasons why I have confidence. We can have confidence. The people of God have confidence that the destination is worth the journey and things will get better. It's absolutely worth it. Verses one and two. The first reason why we need to know that it will get better, things will change. We should be excited with joy in our hearts and confidence and all of those things is this. The Lord is our help. The Lord is our help. Verse one and two, Psalm 121. It says, of course, a song of a sense. I lift up my eyes to the hill. So imagine the psalmist with the people of God as he's writing this song. I lift my eyes to the hills. And he looked tall. He looked massive. And he looked insurmountable. And I know it's all kind of dangerous up there. I know it's all kind of twists and turns and trees and rocks that may fall on me or I may slip or there may be an animal. There may be a robber waiting around the corner. All kind of stuff. But I look to the hill and I'm like, yo, from where does my help come? That's the question that he's asking. From where does my help come? And he answers the question. He says, my help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. I love this psalm. In Psalm 120, the psalmist found himself trying to move himself and God's people mentally, spiritually, and physically out of a very hostile, difficult place. If you read Psalm 120, it is not fuzzy. It's not exciting. It's, it's, it's bad around them. They want peace. The people around them want war. Every time they speak about peace, the people around them are like, no, nah, we want to kill you. Hostile, hard place. Things are trying to get them. But he's trying to move himself and God's people, lead them out um, in a worshipable way, physically, spiritually, and mentally. It had been way too long where they were. But by the time we get to Psalm 121, verses 1 and 2, the conversation and the confidence begin to change. His idea, his perspective begins to change and shift as the writer is face to face with two undeniable folks, realities, two undeniable realities. The first is this. The conversation and the confidence changed because the writer and God's people were faced with two undeniable realities. The first is this, that they need help, both now and in the future. I need help now to get out of where we're going, and I need help getting up this mountain, trying to get up this hill to get to the city of God to worship. I need help. And the second reality that they came to was this, the Lord is their help. When you have insurmountable odds, things you can't predict, things you can't change, you need somebody on your team who can take care of all the things that you can. And they realize this, that the trek is long and it's hard and it's difficult. I need help and the Lord is my help. As the people of God moved closer to the foot of the hill, they started walking this long, hard climb up the mountain. They quickly realized that there were all kinds of uncertainties and dangers and things to worry about. When climbing a mountain, the mountain is too uncertain, it's too unpredictable, and too hard to handle on their own. In a very real way, folks, th these people, they had to go up this mountain to worship, and there were robbers who were waiting sometimes around the corner, around the trees, to catch people slipping. Because they knew they would go with offerings and sometimes money if they didn't have. Sometimes you couldn't carry that with you up the mountain to be able to sacrifice in the temple, so they had to carry money so they can buy it around the temple so that they can offer up sacrifices. So robbers were waiting to try and stick them up. Trees were, were shaking. They could, it could potentially fall on them. Sharp twists and turns. Rocks slipping under their feet. These are all things that were in their way as they were going somewhere where God had commanded them to go. They weren't going because they w just wanted to. God had them somewhere and he commanded them to go. 
Well, I need you to hear this in the same way for us. There are all kinds of stuff that we've been going through in this life. There are all kinds of things that are in our journey, specifically in 2020. But there's things that are beyond 2020 that are unpredictable, uncertain. We don't know some kind of twists and turns that, that may come about in our lives. And we need to come to the place, the same place that this water came to, the same place the people of God had to come to, to realize and to recognize that we all need help. We all need to come to that place where we need help and to look around us and actually answer the question that there's nobody around here that is sufficient enough to help with these insurmountable odds that we have. Therefore, we should arrive to the correct conclusion, the same conclusion that the writer of this song came to, that the Lord, as he looks around and he looks at the hills and he says, where does my help come from? He's like, my help comes from the Lord. We made heaven and earth. I need you to be encouraged by that. That the Lord is our help, not the government, not your 401k, not your IRAs, not other people. The Lord is the one who helps his people. And you got the best one on your team when you have him. But how is the Lord our help? How does the Lord help? What, what should, why should this give us confidence? in life and in in this journey that we're on, that the Lord is the one who is our help. He's the one who's close to us. Why should this give us confidence? When we're facing a long, hard road of climbing a mountain to get somewhere, here's here's how how it helps us. The psalmist looks at this enormous task of climbing this mountain, and he recognizes that his help comes from the one, listen to this, who made the mountain. The psalmist realized as he's looking at the hill, he's looking at the insurmountable odds that he's, his help is the one who made the mountain. He says it here in the second stanza in verse 2. He says, my help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He made that which is bigger than the mountain and he made the mountain himself. He realizes that God is the one who made heaven and earth. Therefore, we, like the psalm writer and the people of God then, should have confidence in the one who made the mountain and he knows the twists and turns, he knows the curves, he knows the challenges, and he knows how to get us to where he's called us to be. God is the one who called his people to build his city on a mountain, to place his name there. God is the one who commanded his people to come up the mountain to worship him three times a year. He is the one who set the destination. He is the one who set the journey and set the course. He is the one who made the mountain. Therefore, he's the one who helps, provides for us to get up the mountain and get to our destination. We need to be encouraged by that. He knows what's around the hills. He knows every trap. He knows every rock that slips. He knows every tree that falls. And he knows what it takes to finish the job. Be encouraged. I know some of us, I know I do, need to be reminded of this all the time. That uh, God is the one who oftentimes places the mountains in our lives. I need you to hear that. Oftentimes, God is the one who places the mountain in our lives. He plans for the twists and the turns. He just calls us to keep walking. And I need you to know this. This is one of the best things God can do for us in our life. It's place mountains in front of us that we have to climb. Why? It's because when you have insurmountable odds, when you have challenges that you can't overcome on your own and only God can help you through it, this is where you see God for who he truly is. This is where you get to hear him in ways that you don't hear from him if everything is easy. This is where you build the confidence and the joy and the faith in your heart that nothing or no one can shake from me when you have insurmountable odds and God shows up and he helps you every single time. Listen, folks, this is 2020 for us. 2020 has been a mountain that God has placed in front of us all. We didn't place it, many of us. We didn't plan for it. It's just here. But it's exactly where we need to be because God's going to show us some things about himself and about ourselves and we're going to have a confidence and a joy built in him as he gets us through it that we wouldn't have if we hadn't had 2020. Can you imagine, and I'm done with this point, can you imagine 
what they were going through while they had to sing this particular song every step of the way up the mountain. I look to the hills, lift up my eyes to the hills from where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. And they have to keep singing it and singing it. You know, the confidence that is built, you know, the joy, you know, how in tune they were. By the time they got up the mountain, their heart was ready. Their mind was ready. They were prepared for worship and living for him and displaying his glory. Because that's exactly what the temple did. It displayed his glory with his people, his name for everybody to see. They were ready for it. And so will we. As we get to where God's called us to be. The second reason why I know that things would get better and why we can have confidence that they will get better. And we should have joy in our hearts. It's found in verses three through eight. And that is this. You're going to see this over and over again in this in this section. The Lord is our keeper. The Lord is the one who keeps us. He not only helps us, but he keeps us when we are unable to keep ourselves. Look at verses three through eight. It says, he would not let our foot, he would not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in. For this, from this time forth and forevermore. I love this section because it ends so beautifully as a summary to what's going on. But in verses 3 through 4, we see that the Lord will keep us from several things. One, verses 3 through 4, he will keep us from the things that we can't see. In verses 5 and 6, we will see that he will keep us from things that we can see, but yet we can do nothing about them. And in verses 7 and 8, he's going to summarize everything he just said in the first six verses. What's happening here is that the people are walking up the mountain and it, your footing is absolutely critical when you're walking up a mountain. It's absolutely very important to you. You could slip at any moment. And when you're walking up a mountain that's steep enough, any slip could mean sudden death. It could take you out and somebody else with you. The, 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 the mountain is unpredictable, it's slippery, and you have to be awake and alert and on your P's and Q's. This is so much like the Christian life. There are so many things that we can't see, oftentimes that we don't plan for, that can take us out if we don't have protection. That can literally, they are trying to take our mind, take our joy take our family, take our faith, take our ministry, take our mission, take all the things that God wants us to have, to thrive, and to glorify him with. There's so many things, even in us, that we can't see from our past and our unredeemed self that are trying to sap the life of Christ from us. And we need protection. We need a keeper. This pandemic, y'all, has been off the chain. None of us saw it coming. Somebody, say, somebody may say, I'm a prophet. I saw this coming years ago. Stop it. Just stop it. Leave it alone. The Bible does say in the last days there will be perilous times, but you didn't, you didn't see a global pandemic, one like this country hasn't seen, all right? None of us saw this coming. Our jobs have been affected. No one planned that one day you could go to work and then you get a pink slip and say, hey, man, we have no longer need of you. And it messes with your bank account in a big, big way. You were doing great until finances in trouble. Some of us, man, our health has been affected, all kinds of things. And we struggle in ways that we didn't plan for. Some of us, we have children who are struggling with their identity right now, struggling with their gender, confused and their sexuality. There, there are some children out there who are trying to scrape the color of their skin off underwater because they don't like what their color brings and they see it and they hear it out in the world. 
None of us plan for those things as a parent to have to struggle with our kids. Or even if you're a kid and you're listening to this, you didn't plan your life to have to struggle with these things. These are all things that we don't see coming. You know what I'm talking about. What it's like to be on slippery, slippery slopes. To be on ground that is moving and you don't know what your next move is. Right now, some of us, we're a little tired, we're a little stressed, and we're slipping. Some of us are slipping back into some old ways, destructive things that are hurting us and crippling us, and we're on the verge of falling off the cliff. If we were honest, we would admit that, that we are. And here's the deal. When your protection is sleep, when your gun is on safety, all kinds of things can creep in and catch you off guard, can pop up and take you out or take someone else out and sing you a lullaby that you can't wake up from. When your protection is sleep, when your keeper is in the holster and it's not ready, locked, cocked, and ready to rock, it could be curtains. If all of our security is in any of those things, they very well can take us out. And they probably will. But here's the joy. Here's the good news and the beauty of this psalm in verses 3 through 4. We are told, he will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. Isn't it good to know that the Lord doesn't sleep? For the lack of a better phrase, for the lack of a better picture, God has insomnia when it comes to looking after his people. He values rest because he commanded it, but he doesn't value sleep nowhere near as much as we do. God doesn't sleep or slumber when it comes to protecting his kids. His cannon, his cannon, his gun is always off safety. Fire red, hot and ready to rock. He's ready to go. He is never caught slipping. Therefore, we can find our help and our security in him. That's what verses three through four tell us. We can be confident that we're going to get up to here. We're going to get to our destination because he never sleeps. He is not caught off guard. He's ready to rock and roll. Man, that's something to be excited about. In verses five through six, what about the things that we can see? So there's things, uncertain things that we can't see. We can't see the robber uh, coming around the corner. We, he's hiding for a reason. We don't know which rock is slippery or not. What about the things we can see? Like this blazing hot sun on a blazing hot day that we're getting closer and closer and closer up the mountain to. What about the things that we can see, but we can't do anything about it? Here's it. Look at verses five and six. He says, the Lord is our keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. He's your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. What is happening here is that for a traveling pilgrim, a traveling person of God, protection is of top priority, especially protection from things like the blazing hot sun. And the heat that comes from it and the unpredictable, but yet events that happen in the daytime and definitely the ones that happen at night and everything in between. Again, he is giving an assurance here. I love this. And the second stanza, we'll get to that in a second, but what the author is using here in verse 6 and these two lines, look at verse 6 again. It says, the sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. What he's doing here, he's using what is called a poetic parallel, which is basically a, a Hebrew fave. If you have your faves in your phone, it's a Hebrew fave on how to express totality, something in its totality. By naming, they do this by naming two or a pair of obvious opposites. To include everything. This is what he means to hear by the sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. Because guess what? The moon doesn't strike anybody, right? But he's naming two opposites to actually describe to you what it means for 
God's protection should be total. And so what, what he's saying here is that the Lord will keep his people from the known and from the unknown, the seen and the unseen, the day and the night and everything in between. And again, he's not promising that life will be perfect. He knows that there will be hills and valleys and there will be difficulties and all of that stuff. But what he is promising is that the Lord would not allow any one of them to destroy you. I need you to hear that. I need to hear it. And everyone in this room and everyone listening, you need to hear that if you belong to God, God will not allow any of the things that you go through in this life to destroy you mentally, destroy you physically, and to destroy you spiritually. You are his. He is your keeper. Some of us, we're in a marriage that we got ourselves into that we knew would be tough, but we didn't realize how tough it would be. We knew that maybe they weren't saved and we married them anyway and now we're stuck in it because we gave our vows and we commit to our vows and we believe our vows and we're going to die with our vows. But you didn't estimate how hard it was going to be. And it's causing you all kind of stress and, and pain and ache and all those things. Some of us, we married into the military. And we thought, hey, we get to see the world. We can travel everywhere and have a ball. But we didn't estimate how difficult deployments would actually be. What it was like to be a spouse and have to stay home and raise the kids by yourself while your military spouse is away having a ball, having a good time. Some of us, you're on deployment right now. You thought it would be great. I get to hold a gun. I get to wear a tight T-shirt. and I get to serve and work for my country and defend the rights and the liberties of our nation. And guess what? You didn't estimate how hard it would be on your thoughts, the things that you see, and the discouragement sometimes of being away from your loved ones, your wife and your family, or your husband and your family, and you get to miss birthdays. Or someone passes and you can't get to them because you're away serving. You didn't estimate how hard it would be. You knew that there was a potential that you didn't realize how hard it was. Some of us, we have situations where our spouse, we knew that one day they could leave, but we didn't know how hard it would be for them to leave, to die before us. Some of them may have been sick, and man, we knew we had to take care of them, but we didn't realize how difficult it would be to live alone. And it's right in front of us every day. Some of us, you may not have any of those realities, but you say, you know what, there's things I saw in my past that if I didn't deal with, they could potentially come back and smack me and get all up in my life and I could be slipping back into them. And guess what? We didn't deal with it. And now they're right in front of our face, pulling us back, slipping off into some dangerous, dangerous things. Things that we're supposed to be dead to. I'm talking about big things are still alive and well. These are all big things in our life, just like the sun and the moon. And many of us, man, we're just tired. We're tired of the heat and we need some shade. Well, I got good news for you. We all need to know that whether it's the seen or the unseen, big stuff and the hell that we face in this life, that the Lord is our shade. It doesn't say that he provides shade. It says here, the Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade. He is the one that protects us from the heat, the blazing hot sun of life that we can run to and find some safety and find a break from all of this. The Lord is the one who can take the blows for you. He covers his kids he says, hit me because I can take it. That's what Jesus did on the cross. He said, hit me, I'll take it. Nail my hands, I'll take it. Put the sin on me, I'll take it. The Lord is our shade. He can stand the heat because he made it. Everybody loves sunny days. I know I love sunny days. But if you're out in the heat too long, if you're out in the heat just way too long, anybody ever been there, you've just been out in the heat way too long, it's too hot and you can't get away from it. You signed up for it or whatever. You're at the theme park with your kids. You're at Disney World. God bless you if you go to Disney World. God bless you. I don't envy you at all with your kids. But go ahead and go. You've been out there way too long. You just want some shade. You want to get out the heat. You'll start praying for some clouds when you've been out in the heat too long. 
Uh, Lord, send some shade or something. Can we get just one cloud? We have the confidence here from this verse, from this psalm here, that the Lord is the one who sends the cloud, but most importantly, the Lord is the shade. And he knows to be there when we need him. And all of us need him right now. Which brings us to verses 7 and 8, which is basically a summary of this psalm, and then we're done. Um, verses 7 and 8 says this, The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. You're going out and you're coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Verses 7 and 8 serve as a summary, basically like the closing lyrics to the song, which remind us of these two things. One, that it is the Lord who keeps our life, not us, not other people, not systems, not entities. It is the Lord who keeps us. I need you to hear that. The Lord keeps your life, not you. You can't do it. It is the Lord. The journey is too hard. The hill is too high. The stress is too much. It is the Lord who keeps you. You can, have, you can rejoice and be confident in him because he can do everything we can't. The second thing this verse reminds us of is that it is the Lord who does not stop protecting his people. He doesn't quit. People may quit. They may walk out, but the Lord doesn't stop protecting his people. This phrase here, you're going out and you're coming in from this time forth and forevermore is a way of saying that God will always take care of his people. He will always take care of it, whether you go out, whether you come in, whether you come into Jerusalem and go back home and have to come back again another time of the year or whatever you're doing. In all occasions, at all times, the Lord will keep you. Now and forevermore, you can bank on it. That's rejoicing. That's, that's dancing music. That's a song you can sing. That's a song you can play over and over and over again and put on repeat. This should be on your playlist, not just God's playlist, because this is the song that they had to sing to God to encourage themselves as they were going up the hill. Which brings us to Jesus. And why does it bring us to Jesus? Because Jesus is at the center of everything. The way that God accomplishes these things in our lives as Christians is by placing a mountain right smack dab in front of our faces. We don't get the glory. We don't get the joy. We don't get the destination without the mountain. I need you to hear that. You don't get to where God's taking you to without having to go through a mountain. The psalmist knew it. The children of Israel knew it. Every Christian that belongs to Jesus needs to know. Jesus promised it. He promised a rough road, but I will be with you always. He promises the victory. I already got the victory. It is finished. He promised I'm coming again. He promised I am with you now. But there will be a long journey along the way. None of the joy and the blessing that we see here in this psalm of God being our keeper, God being our protector, God giving us shade, God being our shade, God is our help, all of these things, none of them happen without a mountain to climb. You may have heard it before, no guts, no glory. I grew up hearing that over and over again, no guts, no glory. Whenever I started playing sports and all that, no guts, no glory. What in the world does that mean to an eight-year-old? We don't get it. But let me just tell you this, for those of us who are in Christ, who are in the Lord, it is this way with God. No pressure, no prize. No sin, no Christ. No Christ, no cross. No cross, no glory. This is the way of God. He places the mountain there to conquer it, and to deepen something in us. An appreciation that and a confidence that we won't have if we didn't have it any other way. I need you to hear this about Jesus. <clears throat> Jesus is the word that made the heavens and the earth. 
which became flesh and lived with us. He lived among us and he lives, ever lives for us. And he holds the world together by the power of his own word, according to John's gospel and Hebrews. The mountains in your life, the mountains that we see out in the world, Jesus made the world. He is the word by which all things were made. And he is the one who enters into his world to show us what it's like to, to see and to know God and to, to be like us and to save us and to redeem us so that we might have his joy in life. He is the one who holds all things together. Jesus is the one who delivers us from all evil and he smacks Satan around like a chump. Like a, I love one of my favorite uh, pastors, Vody Bakum says he, he beat Satan like a tied up goat. That's what he did. Whipped him on a cross and he destroys all of God's enemies and therefore if they're God's enemies, they're our enemies. And so all the enemies that you have, God's got it and he's got you. To find a few things. Jesus is the one who gives us his word. He keeps his word and he gives us his spirit and he gives us his people to encourage us, to prepare us, to protect us and to provide everything that we need to persevere, to hang in there until the end. till we finish the journey. And I love this one, man. Jesus is the one who leads his people into the holy city. Jesus is the one who brings his people into the new Jerusalem called the church. If you read Revelation, that is what the new Jerusalem, that is what the holy city is. It's the church who's decked out like a bride on her wedding day with diamonds and jewels and, and gold and arrayed in everything fine and splendor. It is Jesus who brings us into the church, this glorious bride of his that will have one day an experience of no tears, no death, no crying, no pain, only gl glory, only joy, no need of light, no need of a lamp, no need of the sun anymore because the Lord God is our light. That's what the book says. I didn't write it. That's what the Bible says. And I believe it. Jesus, finally, you need to hear this, is the one who climbed up Calvary's mountain to take upon himself your sin and mine, the sin of the world, to die in our place so that we could have eternal life, both now and forever. All roads lead to Jesus. I pray that you find Jesus as your everlasting joy and a reason to sing, a reason to worship, a reason to celebrate. Even through the midst of being in the pit and the hardship and feel like things won't change, I hope that you find that Jesus is the reason to sing because he is the Lord who is our helper. He is the Lord who is our keeper. He is the Lord God who brings us into his everlasting joy that we can have now and when he returns. I pray that Jesus is your joy. You find your rest in him. And so I end with these last words from Romans 8. Just a little bit of Romans. Got to give you a little bit of Romans. Romans 8. You can turn it if you like. Romans 8, it'll be verses 28 through 39. I'm just going to read them, and then I'm going to pray, and we're done. Romans 8, 28 through 39. It says this. It says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him 
graciously give us all things. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? That's God's chosen. It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised. Who is at the right hand of God? Who indeed is interceding for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it, is, as it is written, for your sake we are all being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, he says, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angel, angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, height, nor height, or death, or anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. May these words encourage you today. Nothing can separate us from his love. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your words and tell us we have an everlasting joy, an everlasting love in Jesus that nothing can take away from us. Help us to have joy in our hearts and to celebrate and to find the peace and the comfort that we need right now in this season in you and not to look at it or look forward in other things, but to see that in you, to long for that in you and to to rest under your arms to find our shade from the sun. Help us to rest in your son, your S-O-N, son, Jesus, as our keeper, as our helper, as our savior, as our Lord, God, and King. Help us to always be drawn to him, even when we stray, even when we get depressed, even when we're by ourselves. Help us to know we're never alone because you're always there. And that this role may be hard, it may be long, it may be high, but nothing can keep us from getting to the destination that you called us to. Nothing. We have that confidence in you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, guys, thank you again for another week. I'm so grateful that you were able to spend this time with me in the Word of God. I can't wait for the day when you're in this building, you're in this room with me, worshiping and singing and praising God, and we get to walk through the Bible again together as a body physically. But be encouraged this week. Love on each other. Always turn to the Lord and have joy in your heart. As always, we thank you for tuning in. If you want to continue to worship with us as a church, we have some new information that we want to give to you very, very soon. So log on to our Facebook page. Stay on our, our website. We'll make sure we get it to you as soon as possible. But until then, continue to worship through your giving. SolaChurchGC.com is where you want to go. If you want to get past messages, you can go on that as well. Find out where community groups are, when we meet for other things as well. We would love for you to hang out with us as we're on this journey, this pilgrimage with God together. Until then, until I see you, grace and peace.